Thank you, Kathy, for playing a little slower. That was very helpful. Let's take our Bibles and turn back to that portion of Scripture that we read just a few moments ago over in Exodus chapter 13, verses 1 through 16. Exodus chapter 13. We're on part three right now of Sanctify the Firstborn. A rather important concept theologically that is set forth for us in this passage in the context of the Passover and in particular the Feast of Unleavened Bread. The Passover signifying, of course, our Lord Jesus Christ, who Paul says is our Passover lamb, who is crucified for us, but you may have noticed in the context here in Exodus 13 the serious emphasis on the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Leaven speaks of sin in Scripture, of that which is unholy, that which is unclean. Sanctification deals with setting something apart to God for the use of holy service, something that has been cleansed, something that has been purified. And so it is set in very, very strong contrast in the text to the Feast of Unleavened Bread, where leaven is totally excluded from being eaten for that entire week. Now, you recall that last week we were looking at how throughout the Old Testament there's a striking emphasis on the firstborn. The firstborn was the beginning of the strength of a man's family. This is clearly seen in the prophetic words of Jacob on his deathbed and later in the specific laws related to children born of more than one wife. And we read out of Genesis 49, which is the prophetic passage dealing with the future of all 12 tribes of Israel. Reuben, thou art my firstborn, my might, and the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity and the excellency of power. Reuben lost the blessing that would have been his as the firstborn by a very foolish and spur of the moment, perhaps, act of immorality. Dear friends, you never know what you're going to lose when you get involved in sexual immorality. Some serious consequences which, though you may be forgiven, leave lasting scars and damage that can only be corrected on the other side of death. Keep yourselves pure. We saw the law as it dealt with a man having more than one wife, and the firstborn comes from the hated wife, and the secondborn comes from a loved wife. The man cannot put the blessing of the firstborn on the one that comes from the wife that he likes. We talked about firstborn males and firstborn females, and we saw that there's a lot of responsibility that rests on the shoulders of every firstborn child, whether male or female, and we looked at the daughters of Zelophehad. He had no sons, he only had daughters. The daughters of Zelophehad were Mala, Noah, Hagla, Milcah, and Tirzah, but no boys. And how God made provision, and it's rather interesting, this provision was made as the very last thing that God commanded before he told Moses to climb the mountain, see the promised land, and die before Israel entered in. God made provision for families where there are only girls, and as you know, we have a lot of families in this church that have only girls. But God made provision for them in Numbers chapter 27, verses 12 through 14. We find the daughters of Lafahad were mentioned six more times in Numbers, Joshua, and First Chronicles. God made a point of that. It wasn't just a sort of a last-minute thought that he then dropped. They are mentioned multiple times. We saw the firstborn daughters also had certain privileges. For example, the first rite of marriage. We saw that in Genesis 29 with Laban and Leah and Rachel. And, of course, he had to trick Jacob into that, but uh, he nonetheless gave that right to his firstborn daughter. We saw the term firstborn is found exactly 100 times in the King James Bible. Only seven of those occurrences are found in the New Testament. Six of those refer to Christ, two referring to the physical firstborn son of Mary, 
Four, referring to his position in relationship to God the Father, and only one related to the actual firstborn slain or redeemed at the first Passover, which is what we're looking at in Exodus. We talked about how that is very significant, that Jesus is called the firstborn in the New Testament so many times in light of the wicked firstborn sons of the Old Testament. There was coming and now has come a firstborn who would redeem the firstborn rights of all those wicked sons who had forfeited their rights and their inheritance. Jesus is called the firstborn son who regained the rights of the inheritance and passed them on to us who are called his brethren in the book of Hebrews. The firstborn son born in the Bible was not called a firstborn, that's Cain, although he was the firstborn. But we saw it's significant to notice that the very firstborn occurrence of the term firstborn is used of a wicked son that God cursed. And we talked about the cursing of Canaan, not the cursing of Ham, but the cursing of Canaan, the father of the Canaanites, and he was the son of Ham. And it was Canaan, not Ham, whom God cursed when Ham saw his father naked and thought it was funny. And we looked at Genesis chapter 9, verses 20 through 25. Then we looked at Canaan's descendants in chapter 10. And we saw that the firstborn that's mentioned there is Sidon, the founder of that city which is one of the twin cities of Tyre and Sidon, which has so many of God's curses on it in the Bible. We saw that Reuben, the firstborn son of Jacob, was also a wicked son. God removed the privilege of the firstborn from him because he committed incest with his father's wife, which, by the way, is also a sin that is cursed in the New Testament in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. That resulted in the permanent loss of the rights of firstborn when Jacob prophetically blessed the tribes that would descend from him. Now, you know, it's rather interesting. Even though he had the rights of the firstborn, Reuben was cursed when the eternal blessings were passed out to the tribes. He had a lot of things in this life, but the eternal blessings is the biggest thing he forfeited. Dear people, you never know what you're going to forfeit by one small act of immorality, of lust, of covetousness, of sloth, of gluttony, of pride, of envy, of hatred, the seven deadly sins are like little triggers that fire very large bullets. Be careful when you think it's not a little thing. It's a teeny thing. It's insignificant. You may have just blown your own brains out. Flee youthful lusts. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. And Paul tells us why it's so severe. What, don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? And that the Spirit of God dwells in you? Paul warns, he says, shall I take one of the members of Christ, which is my body, and join it to an harlot? God forbid! We pointed out the connection to pornography and how that actually rewires your brain. It makes chemical changes in you that change the way that you think. It's not merely a bad habit. It changes your body chemistry. It changes your brain chemistry. It's very dangerous. And then we closed with Esau. Esau is another example of this principle who is given to us as a warning not to treat the blessings of God lightly, just to satisfy the flesh. Too many people are interested in satisfying the flesh. It's one of our enemies, you know. The world, the flesh, the devil, the demons. Those are enemies. Some of them are on the outside, but the flesh is on the inside. Esau is a good example. Hebrews 12, verses 14 and following. 
Follow peace with all men and holiness. We're talking about sanctification. Holiness is the same root word. We should be striving for, we should be earnestly pleading for, earnestly desiring, earnestly working toward holiness in our lives. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness spring up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Now look at verse 16. Here's the context of that. Lest there be any fornicator, that's sexual immorality. Sex outside of marriage that includes all kinds of horrible and gross things. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. Can you imagine? Here you are, the heir to billions of dollars, incredible control and power over a kingdom, great promises for the future. And one day you come in and there's somebody cooking up some sloppy looking bean soup. And you say, you know, I really don't care. I'm going to I'm going to say it. Hey, brother, give me some bean soup and you can have my inheritance. And Esau probably thought, eh, he'll fall for it. He'll give me the bean soup and I'll still get to keep my inheritance. But there was somebody else listening in on that conversation. God was listening in on that conversation. And he said, Esau, you just dispersed, despised your birthright and you're going to lose your birthright. Book of Hebrews makes a point out of that. Listen to what it says. As Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For you know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. Even something you say can cause you to lose a blessing from God. Did you know he repented? But he couldn't get it back. For he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. Young people, you're a virgin only once. Remember that. You can be forgiven, but you lose something you can't get back. I hope you noticed here that sexual immorality is given as an illustration of something that you can do that can never be undone. An act with permanent consequences, no matter how badly you want to reverse it. In the case that we have here in front of us, it was true even with a slave. You lose something, you lose blessings, you can never regain it. Young people and older people, keep yourselves pure. Now, back to new material for today. Let's go back to Reuben for a moment, because he's a great illustration of what we're talking about when we're speaking of the firstborn, how they are to be set apart and sanctified unto the Lord. Reuben was the firstborn who lost his blessings. Now, Reuben was a practical man. He was a man who actually genuinely felt sorry for what had happened. He later tried to make amends by rescuing his brother Joseph from being murdered, which I think is a very commendable deed. He talked the brothers out of killing Joseph and just putting him in the pit because he was going to come back later and try to rescue him. But while Reuben was not around, Joseph was sold as a slave. But you know something? It was Reuben who had the tender conscience when the brothers stood before Joseph, whom they did not recognize in Egypt. Reuben even offered to Isaac 
his own two sons to be killed if he didn't bring Benjamin back to his father on the second trip to Egypt. Reuben tried to do right after he had done the bad thing. But remember, sin has temporal consequences for the believer, even when those sins are forgiven. Remember his rescue attempt over in Genesis 37, verse 21 through 29. And Reuben heard it, and he delivered him out of their hands and said, Let us not kill him. And Reuben said unto them, Shed no blood, but cast him into this pit that is in the wilderness, and lay no hand upon him. Now look at the next phrase. That he might rid him out of their hands to deliver him to his father again. Reuben's motive was not to let Joseph starve to death. Reuben was going to wait till the other brothers weren't all around. Then he was going to go back and pull Joseph out of the pit and give him back to his dad. And Reuben returned unto the pit, and behold, Joseph was not in the pit and he rent his clothes. Later on, we get farther down in the story when Reuben is talking to the brothers before Joseph and he didn't know that that was Joseph up there and that Joseph could actually understand him. They were talking in Hebrew and they figured, yeah, the Pharaoh will never have learned Hebrew, but he, he'll speak Egyptian because Joseph had been speaking to them through a translator. And here's what Reuben says as they're standing there and all of a sudden things are starting to get complex and they're being accused of different things. And Reuben answered them, saying, Spake I not unto you, saying, Do not sin against the child, and ye would not hear? Therefore, behold, his blood is required. And Reuben spake unto his father, down in verse 37, saying, Slay my two sons, if I bring him not to thee, deliver him into my hand, and I will bring him to thee again. I mean, Reuben was doing his best. He's what we would call a good person. But it's not enough. The lesson I think we need to learn out of this is the world, the flesh, and the devil often make their greatest attacks against the firstborn. Are you a firstborn? The devil will make horrendous attacks against the firstborn because the firstborn is the strength of the father. The firstborn has the responsibility of carrying on a godly heritage to the next generation. There are also blessings to a firstborn daughter, but there are also examples of wicked firstborn daughters. Look, for example, at the wickedness of the firstborn daughter of Lot, Genesis 19, beginning in verse 31. And the firstborn said unto the younger, this is after they've run away from Sodom and Gomorrah, God has destroyed the cities with fire because of the Sodomite practices there in those cities, the cities of the plain, Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, Zeboim, the five cities of the plain, only one was spared, Zoar, which is where Lot fled. But the other four were destroyed. The firstborn said unto the younger, Our father is old, and there's not a man in the earth to come in unto us after the manner of all the earth. They were straight. They weren't gay. But they had a perverted view of moral righteousness. They wanted a man. They didn't want a woman. But they said, Man... All the men we know, they just got fried to a crisp. They made their father to drink wine that night, and the firstborn went in and lay with her father. And he perceived not when she lay down nor when she rose. Do you drink alcohol? Do you know how stupid that is? I hope you understand how stupid it is to drink alcohol. Oh, I could preach a whole sermon on that one here. How many young people have gotten into immorality because they took the first drink. All their friends were teasing them. All their friends were kidding them. All their friends were pushing them. All their friends were calling them a chicken. All their friends were saying, oh, it's okay. Go ahead and do it. It's fun. Or that first little puff of marijuana. Or that first little pill. Or that first little shot into the vein. Come on! Be a sport! Dear people, Look what happens. You know what happened with Noah. Now you see it happening with Lot. And it came to pass on the morrow that the firstborn said unto the younger, Behold, I lay yesternight with my father. Let us make him drink wine this night also, and go thou in and lie with him that we may preserve seed of our father. Oh, doesn't that sound like a good reason? Hey, man, we don't want to extinguish his line. I mean, this is our dad, you know. Talk about twisted logic. 
And the firstborn bare a son and called his name Moab, Moab. Moab means from the father. The same is the father of the Moabites unto this day. Think of the incredible pain in the history of Israel because of the Moabites. They were the perpetual enemies of Israel. The younger daughter had a son also. She named her son Ammon. He's the father of the Ammonites. Think of the incredible pain in the history of Israel because of the Ammonites. All because of sexual sin. People, you do not know the extent of your sin down the road and how it will affect generations to come. Both of those groups were enemies of Israel. But you know, in the midst of the wickedness, we see the outpouring of the incredible grace of God. None of them deserved it. But God poured out His grace when He redeemed one young woman by the name of Ruth. She was a Moabitess, a descendant of an incestuous relationship, a virtuous woman, I believe the one who is described in Proverbs 31, 10 through 31. The grace of God in the midst of the most horrendous and painful sin the grace of God that reaches me and you. Oh, people, if we could just see things the way God sees them and understand that the flesh is our enemy, it's not our friend. Moving on. God also viewed Israel as his firstborn son. And that's why God killed the firstborn in Egypt. Let me take you back just a few chapters in Exodus, back to chapter 4, to remind you of that, verse 22 and 23. Thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord, now listen to these words, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. God looked at Israel as his firstborn son. We get down now to chapter 13 and God says, you're going to redeem all the firstborn because I've redeemed my firstborn son. I've redeemed my firstborn son with the slaughter of a lamb over the doorposts. And I've killed the firstborn son of Pharaoh. And I've killed the firstborn all of Egypt who would not take the blood of the lamb. And I say unto thee, let my son go, that he may serve me. And if thou refuse to let him go, behold, I will slay thy son, even thy firstborn. That was all the way back in chapter 4. God gave Pharaoh plenty of warning. He gave him all the plagues. And Pharaoh continued to harden his heart and harden his heart and harden his heart and harden his heart. He would not obey God. And finally God said, all right, time to pull the plug. And that night the angel of death swept across Egypt. And every place there was no blood on the doorpost. The firstborn of man and beast died. And a great wailing was heard throughout all of Egypt. And they thrust the people out in haste. They had their opportunity, but they would not believe. They were going to go their own way. They were going to do their own thing. They were going to live according to the flesh. They did not care about God. But dear friends, someday you will stand and give an account to the living God. What are you doing with your life? 
I hope you begin to see why God commanded Israel to sanctify the firstborn before they could even begin the Passover. God had already sanctified, had already set apart his firstborn son to die for our sins. And sanctifying the firstborn in Israel reminded Israel that failure to obey God always results in death. You know, it's interesting as you go through the Old Testament, even among the other enemies of Israel, God recorded the names of firstborn. How about Genesis 25, 13? These are the names of the sons of Ishmael. Now remember, Ishmael is the son of Abraham and Hagar, the Egyptian bondmaid. These are the names of the sons of Ishmael by their names according to their generations. The firstborn of Ishmael, Nebaiot, and Kedar, and Abdiel, and Mibsam. We find later on with Esau, these are the dukes, the sons of Esau, the sons of Eliphaz, the firstborn son of Esau. God makes a point of letting us know who is the firstborn, because on the firstborn rests a huge responsibility. Carnal Jacob was a secondborn, but you know what? He coveted the rights of the firstborn for himself. Genesis 27, 19, Jacob said unto his father, you know, he's lying to his dad. His dad is blind. His dad can't see. His mom has helped him with this little trick. When Isaac sends out Esau out into the field to try to catch some game, some venison, and bring it back and fix it in a way that, oh man, you know, Isaac really likes it. Gluttony. Failure to control the appetites of the flesh. An attempt to stop God from what God is going to do. It's always going to fail, folks. But Rebecca overhears what Isaac says. And she says to Jacob, listen, go get a kid out of the flock. I mean, that's a lot faster than Esau going out hunting. Even he's a good hunter. You can get the, the kid out of the flock faster. And I can fix it just like your dad likes it. He'll never know that it's not venison. And Jacob protests. He says, Mom, that's not a cool idea because, you know, you know, I'm a house guy and I smell a lot better than Esau does. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a smooth man. He didn't have much hair on him. Uh, and Esau is really, really hairy. And what if, what if he pulls me near and wants to smell me? Uh, what if he feels and, and he says, man, there's no hair here. You're, you're faking it. You're not Esau. And then he gives me a curse. His mom says, look, don't worry about it. Just do what I tell you. And if a curse comes, I'll take it on me. Whew. Talk about family politics that aren't very good. So he goes, gets the kid, kills the kid. His mom fixes it up real nice, fast. And then she takes the skin of this little baby animal and she wraps it around his arm so that it feels hairy. And she puts Esau's coat on him, which smells like Esau. You know, I would hate to have had to live <laughs> there with those guys where they never took a bath. <laughs> what do they smell like after they've been all day running around out in the field and killing stuff and gutting it and, you know, the smell of the dead animals and blood all over them? I mean, anyway, so he smelled like Esau. And he brings it into his father. And his father takes it and he says, you know, uh, come come a little closer. Jacob gets a little closer because Isaac suspects something. And Isaac grabs him and pulls him close and takes a deep breath. He says, yeah, the smell is the smell of Esau. <laughs> Dad's sense of smell hadn't gotten lost in his old age. He knew the difference between how Esau smelled and how Jacob smelled. And then he felt his arms, and he felt the hair, and he didn't know. And so he says, the blessing of the field is upon you. And he gives this incredible blessing to Jacob, an irrevocable blessing. And Jacob leaves. And he has scarcely gone out the back of the tent when Esau walks through the front door of the tent. And Esau says, Arise, Father, I've caught the animal, and I'm going to feast you today. And Isaac begins to tremble. He says, Who are you? He says, I'm Esau. Who do you think I am? He says, Then who did I just give the blessing to? 
And Esau realizes that Jacob just took the blessing. And he begs his dad, but how about me? You've got to have something for me. But you see, he had sold it a long time ago. Ah, oh, the firstborn. There are many other wicked firstborn sons listed in the Bible. We'll go through all of them. I'll give you another one. Judah took a wife for Er, his firstborn, whose name was Tamar. And Er, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord slew him. And then you know the story about... So he gave her the next son, Onan, and God killed him too. And so Tamar wants to, you know, she thinks, man, I haven't had a baby yet. And, and so the next one is supposed to be Shelah, the next son. But Judah's thinking to himself, there's something wrong with that woman. He doesn't blame his sons, he blames the woman. And so Shelah gets grown up and Tamar sees that, you know, she hasn't been given to him as his wife and... So she goes and dresses herself like a prostitute and sits at the corner while Jacob goes out to shear his sheep and he sees her and his wife has recently died and so he decides to hire her to relieve himself. There is so much wickedness in the scripture. It just shows you how bad we are. And Judah is going to be the ancestor of the Messiah. And Tamar, the woman who's his daughter-in-law, she conceives by him and has twins. And one of those, by this horrible relationship, becomes the ancestor of the Messiah. Do you understand the grace of God breaking into human history and our wickedness? Breaking in where we have sinned and pouring out His grace. A lot of wicked firstborns. We had to have a righteous firstborn somewhere to break the cycle of destruction. I can't believe our time is up. I'm going to give you at least the outline of what was going to be a major part of this message. <laughs> Sanctifying the firstborn has some very intense doctrinal implications for us. The doctrine of sanctification, that is the setting apart of some person for specific service to God, has three stages in the New Testament. If you're taking notes, here's a point to take notes. You've got paper there. I've provided pens. Take notes. The three stages of sanctification in the New Testament. Number one is what's called positional sanctification positional sanctification what does that mean in a nutshell that is how God sees us in Christ that's Ephesians chapter 1 how God sees us in Christ that's our position when you trusted in Jesus Christ the Holy Spirit did 34 specific works and putting you in Christ is one of them. And so when God sees you, he sees you through the lens of his son. You're in Christ. And as he looks, he sees the blood of Jesus covering your sins. He sees you as complete in him. As completely fulfilled in the beloved I wish we had time to go through Ephesians chapter 1. Maybe we will someday. Second aspect of sanctification is what's called either progressive or practical sanctification. Progressive means it's something that's going on right now. Practical means it's something that applies to real life right now. That is, how God is transforming our lives into the image of Christ day by day. Positional, practical, how God is transforming our lives into the image of Christ, David, I, and ultimate. The third stage is ultimate sanctification. Ultimate sanctification is the state of sinless perfection. It's achieved only when we die and are present with the Lord in heaven. Ultimate sanctification is when we're released from our old sin nature, which is always attached to our body that is subject to death. 
Now, when we're dealing with sin, there's the sin nature. There is active sin. There is passive sin. There is sin of commission, where you're doing it. There is sin of omission, where you fail to do what you're supposed to do. But you can start doing what you've not been doing. You can stop doing what you have been doing. But your sin nature is still there. And the only way that that gets out of you is when you die. We will have no sin nature either in our intermediate state before the resurrection, and we'll certainly have no sin nature in our resurrected body. Well, we're way past time. We're going to talk about the verses that deal with that and how that relates us back to setting apart the firstborn in Egypt, the Lord willing, the next time I'm with you. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word and for its power, for the privilege of knowing the Lord Jesus Christ, who has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. What great and precious promises your word declares. Jesus is made sanctification for us. Paul declares it in 1 Corinthians. Father, we pray that you might teach us the importance of living a holy life now. A sanctified life, which is a holy life. Not merely because we have our fire insurance, we've got the escape from hell. But because we love you and we want to please you. We want to, don't want to do the things that offend you or cause you tears as you see the damage that's being done to us by our stupid sins. That's why you weep, not just because it hurts you, but because you love us and you see it's hurting us. Father, we pray that you will take your word and apply it. Every one of us here in this place has some form of sin that we're toying with in our minds or perhaps with our speech or maybe it's gotten as far as our actions. We've lost the battleground of the mind. We've lost the battleground of the speech. We've lost the battleground of the motives. We've lost the battleground of the attitudes and now we're standing on the battlefield of the actions and we're losing the war there. Father, if there's someone here like that, bring them under strong conviction of their sin, cause them to flee the enemy, cause them to renounce the flesh, cause them to say no to the seduction and the temptations and the lusts that are pursuing them. Let them run safely into the rock that is higher than they are, into the shadow of your wings, into the cleft of your hand. Deliver them from evil. For Jesus can do it. Give them the courage and the strength to say no. I belong to Jesus. I will obey him. Whether it's a boy or a girl, a young man or a young woman, an older man or an older woman, Father, we commit it to you. You know our hearts. And Father, how we thank you for your grace and mercy. How we thank you for Jesus, who died for all of those sins. In Jesus' name, amen. Our closing hymn for today is number 540, and this is the only place your hope is found.